Bible claims all people are descendants of Adam and Eve, and also from Noah's three sons and daughters-in-law. Is this really possible? How do we get to seven billion people from six people in just several thousand years? And where did all the human races come from if we started with two people? The answers are surprising. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Races and Human Populations with Dr. Rob Carter. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my great privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Robert Carter, did his undergraduate work at Georgia Tech, and he earned a PhD in marine biology at the University of Miami. Currently, he's a popular, much in demand speaker for Creation Ministries International out of their U.S. office here in Atlanta, Georgia. His research centers on the field of human genetics, human history, and other issues related to biblical studies. Good friend, good to have you here. Thank you. What are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about the issue of races, racism, human populations, and where all these people came from in biblical history. That's fascinating. You know, the whole business of races and then racism is something that Christians really need to understand. So you have something very valuable for us. I'm going to ask you to go up to the board and share it with our viewers. Okay, the first point that we need to make is that the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. Genesis is an all-comprehensive account of God creating everything, where it came from, and how long ago it happened. So a biblical perspective has to start at Genesis 1. Yes. That's right. Now, in Genesis, it claims that all people on earth today descend from the two original people, Adam and Eve. It also claims that about 1,600 years after Adam and Eve were created, a global flood covered the world, and only eight people, the people who were on board Noah's Ark, survived. The Bible also claims that a few generations after the flood... All people were dispersed from a central location called Babel. It's fascinating because really then there's three starting points, aren't there? Yes. We start with Adam and Eve. We restart with Noah's sons and daughter-in-laws. And then we restart at the Tower of Babel. Yes. Okay. Now thinking about Babel for a moment. Babel is somewhere over in here in the Middle East. Okay. Okay, that arrow is not quite perfect, but it's over there. The Bible says that all people migrated from that central location. Now that's really interesting because modern geneticists have discovered that pattern. The same pattern. The same pattern. Now they don't want the center of origin there. They put the center of origin over here in East Africa. And they call that the out of Africa event. Okay. Now based on human genetics, this is actually the female line, the, the mitochondrial DNA, they have people groups starting here in Northern Africa and then spreading out around the world, actually just like the Bible indicates. You see, as soon as you cross this, that's the Tower of Babel story. But the scientists have moved the origin there because it's too uncomfortable with this Middle Eastern thing. <laughs> okay, great. So that's the basic Bible idea of human history. Where do races come from? How do we get Chinese people and African people and Icelandic people? Why, the, the people look different. What happened and how do we account for them in just a few thousand years? Well, let's, let me give you a, an illustration here. This is a family tree that I made for an, an article that I, I published in, in uh, CMI's Journal of Creation. I call it Inbreeding and the Origin of Races. <laughs> this is the family tree of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Starting with... Terah. Terah is Abram's dad. Terah is Abraham's father and Abraham's wife, Sarai's father, Sarah. They had Isaac, they had Jacob, and Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. Interesting. Now, you know how um, 
you inherit 50% of the DNA of each of your parents. Yes. Well, that means you have 12.5% of each of your grandparents. Right. And six and a quarter percent from each of your great grandparents, and then three ish percent from your great great grandparents, and a percent and a half from your great great great. So every generation you get less and less DNA from your ancestors. If this is 50 percent, and that's 25, and that's 12 and a half, these people should be in about the six percent range. About six percent of their DNA should have come from Terra. Okay. Except because there's so much inbreeding in this family. Ah. Oh. Because Abraham married his half sister. Isaac genetically is identical to their brother. Wow. Ooh. But see, the Isaac then married his second cousin and second cousin once removed Rebecca. <laughs> but then Jacob married his cousins, Rachel and Leah, who are much closer than cousins because they're all related in multiple different ways to Terah. And when you add up all the percent similarities here at the end, they're not between 1.6% identical and 6.3% identical. That's about the range it should be. They're actually 22%. 22%. That's a huge difference. So 22% of these 12 brothers, their DNA is identical to Tara's DNA. But not only that, a lot of uh, this 22%, about half of it, they inherited the exact same two pieces of DNA. So if Tara had um, a stereotypical trait like curly hair or a big nose or he's really tall or something like that, there's a pretty good chance that that trait is found in two identical copies in all the brothers. So all of a sudden we're going to get racial features appearing very quickly. Because of the intermarriage. Because of intermarriage. And, and this is just one example from the Bible. Right. This is true of all of human populations throughout all of human history. So the different distinguishing factors pretty much come from pulling out of the same gene pool, is that? Yes. Okay. And, I mean, in, in human history, most people married someone who lived within about 12, uh, 10 or 12 miles from where they were born. Okay. That means you're marrying your cousin. Right. Or you're, yeah, again and again. And this, so this pattern is what we, or what That's we expect. It's very helpful to understand it. It is. You know, most people, they, they don't think they would be inbred. Everyone's inbred. There was a geneticist that calculated that every person, every English person living in England is at most fifth cousins from every other English person living in England. Wow. Woo. Okay. What we have here in this inbreeding scenario is called a genetic bottleneck. Imagine that this is a population of people and the colors in here are all the different genes. Okay. Now let's say we reduce that population to only a, a few people. So we shake out a couple of marbles into this glass and now we've only got a couple of colors there. We lost most of the genetics. And if this population starts to grow and grows enough to become a new large population, you can see we've lost most of the colors in that initial population. And a couple of mutations have occurred, so now we have a couple of new colors in there. But it sure is overwhelming two colors. Yes. A genetic bottleneck reduces genetic diversity. And this is what should have occurred as people spread out across the planet. Because they went in small people groups, which meant you're marrying someone closely related to you. Right. You're going to lose a lot of that. Now, this is something that I drew using a, a computer program a friend of mine wrote and he publishes. Really interesting computer program. Instead of, it, it, this is genetic data. But instead of the letters A, T, G, and C, it uses colored pixels. Red, green, blue, and black. So those are the four letters in the genome. Okay. Each line is a person. So several hundred people in this chart, all the way down to here. Each line is a person. And each column is a letter in the genome. All right. So we can see in a population, this is one population, all the genetic diversity. So like this letter right here is either a blue or a red. Blue, red, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. That's A or G or so, I think it's A and G. So that letter, you can see who carries what letter. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because we can compare two different populations. This is an African population. This is the Europeans. Help me to distinguish. What do you see? In the Europeans, well, I see you see a lot more 
uh, straight lines without yes. dots in this one that yes. I'm doing that one. You see the effects of a population bottleneck. Okay. The European, the whole continent is actually founded by only a few people. Oh. And you can see this big block right here. Uh -huh. That chunk of DNA is also inherited by these people and by this person. That means they have the same ancestor. Okay. The DNA has been scrambled through the generations. They inherited this big chunk. But you see this right here? Straight lines. There is no diversity in that section. That happens to be one of the main genes for skin color. Oh. The reason why Europeans have light skin is because they lost all the genetic diversity in that gene that codes for other skin colors hmm. through inbreeding. <laughs> that makes people uncomfortable. I'm not inbred. Yes, you are. And so is every person on this planet. The reason you have some stereotypical racial look is because you're inbred. Because you've only married generations after generations through people who live close to you. It's sense. just getting at where races came from. Makes sense. Okay. Take the circle. Imagine that this is all the genetic diversity of all the people in the world. All right. Now let's draw a circle for one person. How big do you think that circle would be? About one third. Okay. So you have about one third of the world's genetic diversity. But if you pull people from the same population this person came from, each person has about a third. In fact, you take four or five people from even Iceland or China or Australia, just four or five people from any of those populations, and you have about 99% of the world's genetic diversity in those four or five people. Amazing. A, a famous um, uh, geneticist, uh, Luis Quintana Murci, he said, I have to explain this though. The word phenotypic is the way things look. So the genes that explain the differences in the way people look only represent a tiny part of our genome. Confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. There is no such thing as race. No, but modern genetics is what destroyed old ideas about races and racism. And it actually took DNA technology before we realized, wait a minute, there aren't differences amongst people across the world. Now that brings up an interesting question. In Genesis chapter 4, after uh, Cain killed Abel, God says, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and wander on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be a hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Does that mean there's other people on the earth? Does that mean Adam and Eve aren't the only people? So people have been struggling with this for a long time. Um, were there other people around? Was it just Adam and Eve that started everything off? Um, did God create one race or many races? An idea, it's an idea called polygenesis or multiple origins. And this idea actually came into Christianity and in scholarship after the European discovery of other people. People with dark skin, people with different looks. They're trying to explain, you know, they thought they were the definition of people and these other people were very different. What do you do? Well, maybe, maybe there's multiple origins of people. But I answered it this way in an article I wrote, how old was Cain when he killed Abel? Most people, you know, Cain and Abel are born and they, one kills the other. And then they never really think about when that happened. And I answer in the article that there is 130 years. Wow between creation and when their other brother, Seth, is born. Seth is the first son born after Abel's murdered, and Eve names him prophetically as a replacement for her son that's murdered. But that means that there's all this time. There could have been other sons born. Sure. There could have been daughters born. In fact, if you think about it, if Seth is only the third child, Eve's only having a child every 43 years. <laughs> that's, that's really, that's, that doesn't sound like what would have happened. But because we have all this time, Cain, there could have been a thousand people or more alive at that time or more by the time 130 years have passed. And so we have to ask the next question. What would Adam and Eve have looked like? Would it have been white? Would it have been black? Would they have been somewhere in between? Actually, I believe that they would have been somewhere in between. Probably. I think this skin color, actually that, that place on the chart I showed you where there's no variation, that's a mutation. I have a broken gene. I can't produce melanin. I don't think they were white. Nor do I think that they were the darkest that people can be. And if we look at the distribution of skin color around the world, we see that, you know, somewhere around where the Tower of Babel would have been, there's kind of a lot of middle-toned skin colors. 
my first approximation is they probably had middle tone skin and then add population bottlenecks and some mutations on top of that to the skin color genes. And it would not take long at all to get the different colorations of people that we see around the world. In fact, it would be easier to move both ways to darker and lighter from the middle yes. than it would if you started at one end. It would happen more quickly probably. Yes. There's another thing that floats around. Um, I've heard it several times. Now when I hear it now, I get really angry because it's biblically wrong. But there are people that believe that, that black people are dark because they were cursed by Noah. Noah got drunk and when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son who had mocked him had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So there is a curse, but the curse isn't on Ham, it's on Canaan, Ham's son. And if we look at a family tree of the descendants of Noah, as Japheth, Shem, and Ham, we realize that Canaan, wait a minute, Canaan, those are the Canaanites. Right. They lived in Canaan land. Right. That's now called Israel. Wow. In fact, most of Ham's descendants didn't live in Africa. They lived in the Middle East. They lived in Asia Minor. And this approximate, saying that, that the black people are dark because Ham was cursed is wrong biblically. It's wrong genetically. And no one actually should believe that. Well, that's good to know because there's been a lot of hatred yes. coupled into that uh, misnomer. Yeah. Yes. And we talk about races, man, it's some fascinating stuff. These two people are actually a model of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Each one of these people has mixed race ancestry. They have a black father and a white mother. And they had these non-identical twin girls. One of them is African colored. One of them is European colored. We got black and white twins in one generation. If that information for the skin color was actually programmed in Adam and Eve, it wouldn't take long at all to get a range of, of skin tone variations. We can also talk about things like, like organ transplants. Right. I mean, if people are really different from each other, you shouldn't be able to swap organs around. But these two guys, they were good friends during the Vietnam War. They're from Australia. Well, Bill Colbera, he's an Australian Aborigine. And George, his nickname is Snow for obvious reasons. George Wilson, he's a European. Well, when they got to be old men, Bill needed a kidney transplant and they couldn't find a, a donor. George volunteered to get tested and turns out he was a match. How can you have tissue transplants between people that are, that are separated for tens of thousands of years in the evolutionary model? Well, the answer is simple. They haven't been separated for tens of thousands of years. Rob, don't you go anywhere because this is really important stuff. And you stay right with us. We'll be right back. back on Origins with Dr. Robert Carter. And Dr. Carter, as we talk about the races and populations and, the, and genetics and all of this, uh, you got a biblical example of mixed race marriages that we can talk about? Actually, there are lots. There's but lots before that, we have, to, we have to explain why the Bible uh, in the Old Testament seemed to restrict marriage. Okay. Uh, one reason was that God didn't want the, the Israelites to stray away from their religions. He said, right. don't marry people from other cultures. Right. Another reason, though, is because of land. They couldn't marry outside their own tribe because the land titles would have gotten scrambled. And all of a sudden, you'd have someone from this tribe when he landed in another tribe. So, so kind of God's building parameters, first of all, because he doesn't want the faith, not the, not the race, but the faith of the yes. Israelite to be contaminated. Yes. And secondly, when they get in their tribes, there's legal issues. There's, there's land issues. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Um, but then when you actually look at the history given to us in the <laughs> Old Testament, Abraham had servants from Egypt. He had 125 trained soldiers when he went to rescue Lot. Those people, that was after the covenant was given. That was after circumcision. Those men would have been part of the covenant. Yeah. What about the female servants? I mean, they would have married into the family because that's what happens over time. Right. So you don't, they didn't even start from a, a strict genetic stock. Then Joseph marries an Egyptian. Well, that means the matriarch of the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim was an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. Moses marries a Midianite. Right. Rahab was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabite. Bathsheba's husband was a Hittite. We have all these examples of people from outside of Israel 
marrying into Israel. So, and, and God did not condemn that because it wasn't breaking those two things that you said they wanted to protect. That's right. He didn't condemn it when a faithful person married in. Right. He did condemn it several times when after marrying in, people were straying away from... When you get a Jezebel that's bringing in the yeah, Canaanite faith and yeah, that kind and, of thing. and things right? like that. Right. But look at, look at the New Testament here, Colossians 3.11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. See, in Christianity, there are no racial boundaries. Don't you love that? I absolutely love it. We're all family with God. Absolutely. And I think of all the, the thousands of white European missionaries who went to Africa in the 1800s and died there trying to give the gospel to those poor suffering people. Because they understood that verse. Because they understood that verse. We're all the same color in the blood of Jesus. Absolutely. Amen. And yet in evolutionary history, yeah. there's um, a sordid backstory here that most people aren't aware of. Uh, Charles Darwin specifically, he was really, he was the father of scientific racism that was really popular in the 1800s and the first half of the 1900s before World War II essentially. And he wrote some things in his particular book, The Descent of Man, in which he wrote in 1871. He said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man, which he meant Europeans, will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world, which he meant all the black and brown people. Right. Now the, the Orientals, he actually had a, he had a hierarchy with Europeans at the top and then the Orientals and then brown people and then black people. Right. But then he continues. He said, at the same time, the anthropological apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider. For we'll intervene between man and a more civilized state, which he meant European, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. That, that just enrages me. That, that is so, first of all, totally not politically correct. <laughs> Second of all, biblically nonsense, scientific nonsense, and thinking of the history of, of this race issue from the eight, late 1800s until today is fueled by some of this. I mean, he essentially said that this is history now, and all the black people and all the great apes will be exterminated, so you have Europeans and gorillas, and that's good for, uh, for evolutionary history. Yeah, that's oh. a good thing that we exterminate all of that. Oh, and this so, was played out, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, it was played out. Yeah. You're, you're talking about like, you know, World War II? Now, I know the Hitler analogy is used over much, but Adolf Hitler was absolutely applying Darwinian theory to the German population. And it wasn't just getting rid of, of the Jewish people. Oh, no. He applied it to the German people. He wanted to fight a war to kill off all the weak Germans so the German race would be stronger. Oh. Now, just think about if we take the biblical approach here, there aren't a lot of differences between people. We saw that already. Yeah. But how far apart are people in time? Well, if we look, if we just assume a 30-year generation time, which is the human average today, and we calculate a, a biblical date for the flood of 4,500 years, well, 30 years per generation, there's only been about 150 generations in all of human history. Okay. That means that everyone across the planet is kissing cousins. <laughs> and genetically, that's what we've discovered. We're much more similar than the geneticists had ever uh, uh, attempted to estimate. It's really funny how the modern genetics has brought all the similarity into a biblical model and it invalidated all the evolutionary models for the first 100 years of evolutionary theory. Now, all that said, there's two important Bible verses to read. One is Romans 5.12. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. This is telling us that all people today, the descendants of Adam, that one man, are suffering and dying because of the effects of sin. And that the effect of sin needs to be removed for us to be saved. Well, Isaiah 59, 20 says, And a Redeemer will come to Zion. Now that word Redeemer, that's the same word used at, for Boaz right. in Ruth. He was the kinsman Redeemer. He had to be related to the person that needed to be redeemed. Right. Well, the kinsman Redeemer is Jesus. A, a kinsman Redeemer will come to Zion. 
to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Well, you know what? All people are descended from Adam. Jesus had to be a descendant from Adam. That means that all people are related to Jesus. All people are related to the kinsman redeemer. That means that salvation knows no racial or national boundaries. Well, that's powerful. And I love a little phrase you said just a moment ago, that genetics has really proved the Bible model and has refuted the evolutionary model. Uh, I just wish we could get the word out. And you're doing all you can to do that. We appreciate it. You know, my friends, all of this is just to prove that it's God's view that He created you. And that should be your world view too. See you again soon here on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friends. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program No. 1615, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. If you like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download an episode guide at OriginsTV.org. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.